How's everybody doing this morning? Everybody doing well? It's great to see you here this morning. So, ex- so excited to be with you. And, uh, you know, as, as Jordan mentioned, we do have a lot that's happening and, and we're gearing up for for the new year. Very excited about the men's time uh, this Thursday night. I will be there. I hope you will as well. And uh, it's going to be a great time. Also, you know, I, to- I said last week that we have a lot that... Uh, is, is, is on its way, getting started. And one of the things that's starting this week also, uh, tonight, is Fusion. Uh, it's our uh, youth ministry here at Cross Point Church. And so uh, Pastor Ross will be kicking that back off for the new year. It'll be the first Fusion of the year. And, and then not only that, but a lot of exciting things planned. He, he was out in the hallway uh, when I was walking in this morning. He was passing out a, uh, a calendar of events for 2020, and I love that. And one of the things that was really cool to me was was a, a Disciple Now weekend that is coming up uh, February the 28th uh, through March the 1st. So about, about six, seven weeks away. And uh, I tell you, a Disciple Now weekend is one of those weekends where students have this remarkable opportunity to just come together in a, in a unique situation and discover more about who Christ is and what he has in store for them. And so I'm, I'm very excited about that weekend for our students. And uh, I just want to ask you to be praying for our student ministry as we go forward, as we go into the uh, 2020, that, that God would just really do some amazing things there. Uh, you know, I, I know that, that as, the, as the church, any believer, any follower of Christ belongs to the church and makes up the church. But I want you to know that that our student ministry makes up the future leaders of our church, too. And so I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, it's something that we need to be praying about all the time is praying for our, our youth and our college ministries here at Cross Point Church. And, and, uh, and Pastor Ross is doing an amazing job with our students and just so excited for him and for our students. And so that's just one more thing that's coming down the, the pipeline. Uh, he's got a whole bunch of stuff on here uh, that you, if, if you want to grab one of these at the welcome desk, you can, uh, and, and students get involved. I tell you, it's going to be a, a great year. But it's good to see you here this morning, so excited about everything that we have going on, and, and so excited about, uh, about the message here this morning. Uh, last week, we kicked off a, what I believe is a great start to a series that's going to be very impactful for not only us as a church, but us as individual followers of Christ Jesus, walking through the book of Philippians, and I love this book. It's a great book to walk through, uh, but just walking through this book, and uh, the question that I asked last week was, how might our lives look different this year if we had the mindset that we were going to live for the glory of God, and that no matter what, we weren't going to allow anything to rob us or steal our joy from us, and so that was sort of the question. We'll sort of dive into that a little bit more today. But this morning, we're asking another question. And it's a simpler question, certainly a shorter question. But the question is, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? And I want you to just sort of grab onto that question. And as we walk through this, this message today, I pray that God will answer that for you. Where do we go from here? Uh, I know for many of you, as you think about the new year, you're wondering, you know, what lies ahead, what's in store for you, and that's always a great thing to sort of think about and, and, and wonder about, but, uh, but I believe that God wants to change lives, and he wants to do some incredible things, and so that's a great question for us to, to sort of kick off uh, with this morning. Uh, I was reading a quote this week by W.M. Lewis. He was an educator and author and and, and he said this, and I thought it was really interesting. He said, the tragedy of life is not that it ends so soon, but that we wait so long to begin it. The tragedy of life is not that it ends so soon, but that we wait so long to begin it. In 1999, I surrendered to a calling on my life for vocational ministry. It was a, it was a calling that that came as a result of me going through a very dark time in my life and then God restoring me and, and revealing to me this calling that was on my life. It was a time where, uh, and I shared a little bit of this with you last week, but I was talking about the rich young ruler, that story there and how that impacted my life. And, and I realized that what was needed in my life more than anything else is to be a, a follower of Christ Jesus. And so at age 36, 
At age 36, I, I came to this place in my life where I said, no matter what, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to live for the glory of God. I'm going to, in every way I can, try to live my life in such a way that I bring glory to his name. And so that was a commitment that I made. It was, a, it was something that, that it was really important to me. And it was, a, it, was, it, was a, it was a time in my life where really I was just trying to figure out, you know, what's next for my life. But I made this, this commitment to follow Jesus, to ask Jesus to come more into my life than, than he already was. I mean, he, he's, he's there. He exists. The Spirit of God dwelled in me. I was a believer. But I just, I just wanted the mindset of, of living my life to bring glory to God and, and, and to just trust in him and to have the faith to follow him wherever it was that he takes us. But this, this quote that I said a while ago was something I really struggled with. Because as I was looking at this quote this week and I was thinking about the tragedy of life is not that it ends so soon, but that we wait so long to begin it. And I believe at age 36, that's where I found myself, just really at a place with, uh, with so many regrets of why I wasn't following Jesus already in the way that I needed to. And so this is a, a powerful question for us to ask, even though on the onset it may seem very simple, where do we go from here? You know, what does God have in store for us? What's next in our life? And so that's what this message is about this morning. I want you to invite you to pray with me as we prepare to dive into God's word and worship him through the reading and the preaching and the hearing uh, of God's word. So pray with me if you will. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit of God, Lord, we thank you for your presence in this place and in our life every day. And God, we thank you for the opportunities we have each and every day to to just grab onto you and follow you, God, wherever you lead, wherever you go, to trust you with our life, to be people of faith, to recognize the divine appointments and opportunities that you give us in our life to, to make a difference for your glory. Father, we thank you for all of that. But Lord, we also thank you for opportunities like this where we gather in this room together as a faith family and as we gather in this place, we, we turn to your word for instruction. We turn to your word for guidance. God, we turn to your word to, to challenge and convict us as we, as we think about our life and as we see people's lives played out like the Apostle Paul as he writes to a, to a faithful gathering of believers in the city of Philippi. God, we thank you for your word and Lord how it, it instructs us in such an incredible way and it teaches us how to live our lives as faithful followers of Jesus. And so, Father, I pray today as we dive into your word, God, that you would speak deeply into our hearts. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to encourage you this morning to turn with me to uh, the book of Philippians. Uh, we started last week in chapter one. We're going to continue. And, uh, and what I want to read for you this morning is verses eight through 11 and so we're going to be kind of looking at that. And last week, uh, we were talking about the fact that the Apostle Paul was writing this letter uh, from a prison cell. He was imprisoned at the time. He was in a very desperate situation. He didn't know what his life, uh, the, the future of his life held for him. He, he was uncertain if he would even have a future, if he'd be put to death or whatever. But he was imprisoned in Rome. But we also talked about how this man put on display for us uh, what it looks like for a man who, despite his circumstances, is at peace, and even more so, has joy in his heart in the midst of that circumstance. And so we look at Paul's life and we say, man, how do, how do you live your life in such a way that, that despite where you find yourself in this world, that your heart can still be filled with joy and peace and certainty that comes from Christ Jesus. So I don't want to preach that message again, but that's kind of what we were looking at, and we, we talked about how this is important uh, for us to, to know and to learn, because it seems as though so many today, even believers, are living their life, and there's just this absence or void of joy in their life, and so that, that's, that's not something we want. We, we want to be joyful people. We want to be content. We want to be uh, understanding that God is is present, and he is faithful, and so we want to find that joy and that peace in our life. And so Paul sets the example for us. And so last week, Paul says, be joyful. But this week, Paul seems to be saying, 
what's next? What, what's next for your life? And the way he communicates this is really sort of incredible because what he begins to do is pray for that gathering of believers. And I love this because when, when someone begins to pray specifically for things to happen in your life, they are basically saying, I hope this is next in your life. I hope this comes to fruition in your life. I hope this becomes a reality in your life. And so the Apostle Paul, he, he never uses the word. He doesn't ask them what's next, but he says, this is what I'm praying to be next in your life. And I love that. And so I want us to look at that this morning as we dive into God's word and, and just read this together. Read with me starting with verse 8 here this morning. So the Apostle Paul, he says, for God is my, my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. You know, one of the things that we recognize as we look at God's word and specifically as we read Paul's letters, we begin to realize that the Apostle Paul had a great affection and love for people who were followers of Christ Jesus. In other words, he cared for the believer. He cared for the child of God. He had a deep concern and care for those who were followers of Jesus. And we see this in several different ways. We see it in his letters to the church. As we read all the different letters, whether it's the letters to the Roman church or, or to the Corinthians or to the Colossians or to Galatians or uh, all these different letters that he wrote to the local church, we see this great, this great admiration and this love that he had for people who were followers of Christ. And we begin to realize that because of this great love that he had for people who were followers of Christ, we begin to recognize that he hopes for the very best for them. He teaches what he teaches and he preaches what he preaches that they would have a greater understanding of the gospel, that they would have a greater understanding of who Jesus is, and that they would allow Jesus to impact their life in ways that maybe no other way could, could happen. And so Paul is, is preaching and he's teaching. We even see it in his letters to his, his, his two preacher boys. We have two letters to Timothy and one to Titus, which reveal to us this love that he has for even the sort of the next gen of people coming up and those young pastors. And we see that this is a man who, who loves these men and he, he has great concern for them. But everything that he teaches, everything that he preaches to them it's for their own good. It's for their spiritual maturity. It's for their growth in the Lord. It's so that they can become better followers of Christ, that they could turn away from their sin and they could pursue the righteousness of Jesus. Everything that he preaches and teaches. But we don't only see it in his preaching and his teaching. We also see it in the Apostle Paul's prayer life. The way he prays in Scripture reveals to us that he cares deeply for the church. He cares deeply for the individual follower of Jesus. We read here in verse eight, he says, for God is my witness. He says, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And so he acknowledges this affection that he has for Jesus and for them. And he, he, he's just filled with this sort of love and affection toward everyone. And so he acknowledges that and he says, I yearn to be with you. I yearn to, to be in your presence. No doubt he would rather be there than in prison, right? But it's what he says next that's so profound. In verse 9, he says this and he says, and it is my prayer. Now I want you to visualize what's happening here for a moment. We have the apostle Paul who's in a prison in Rome. It, it, it reveals in Scripture that Paul was chained to a guard. 
I can't imagine this was a very clean place. It wasn't a very sanitary place. It was a place that, that was a little bit unbecoming of maybe what his lifestyle would have been and certainly for anybody that lived in this world. But here a man was imprisoned in Rome. Here a man was that was locked away and uncertain about his future. And what we don't see in the Apostle Paul is a letter where he says, hey, Philippians, I know you love me. I know you support me. Hey, can you do something to get me out of here? He doesn't say that. In fact, as he's praying, he doesn't even ask that they would, they would pray for him. He, his intentions are not on himself. This is not a man who says, man, if you could just remember me in your prayers, I'm hurting over here. I'm suffering over here. This is a bad place to be. I don't know what my life is going to look like in the next few days. I don't even know if I'll still be around much longer so pray for me. No, you don't see that in the apostle's letter, letter to the Philippians. He says, in spite of the fact that he is chained in prison, he says, I love you, church. I'm thinking about you. I would love to be with you. But here's the truth. I'm praying for you. He's praying not for himself, but for others. For others. And so we read this and it just sort of sets the stage for what we're going to learn from this passage. To think that, that Paul is, is loving on those whom he knows and who knows are living for Jesus out there. As he focuses his prayer life not on himself but on the future of those who are outside of his life at the moment. What is he praying for? He's praying that they would be full, that they would be made complete. He's praying that they would grow spiritually, that they would experience the presence of God in their life like they never have before. He's praying that they would not remain the same, but that there, was, there would be much greater awaiting them in the future. He is praying, he's saying, this is what I'm praying for. I'm praying that you would grow in your relationship with the Lord. I'm praying that you would, you would come to this understanding that, that God wants more of you and he is offering much more to you. And through this, this relationship that you have with Jesus Christ, you are going to discover things about who he is and about your life that is going to fill you to the brim with his presence. And so the Apostle Paul, he's praying this. He says, I'm praying that you become alive in Christ Jesus. Isaac of Stella, you probably don't know this guy. He was a theologian and philosopher of the 1100s. I don't think there's any of us old enough in here to, to remember this guy. He wasn't around even in my lifetime, okay? And I know some of you think I'm really, really old. I've still got a lot of life in me, even though I have crossed that threshold of half dead, okay? He wasn't around when I was around. Or I wasn't around when he was around, I should say. But he says this, and I love this. He says, may the Son of God, who is already formed in you, grow in you, so that... For you, he will become immeasurable, and that in you, he will become laughter. I love that. That in you, he would become exaltation and the fullness of joy, which no one can take from you. You remember last week, we, we asked the question, what might our life look if we don't allow our circumstances or other people in our life to steal our joy? Amen. Are you still wrestling with that one? Are you still working on that one in your life? You should be. You should be getting up in the morning bringing glory to God and knowing, knowing, knowing that nothing is gonna steal your joy because of who Christ Jesus is and what he has given you, nothing in this world and nobody. You know what happened? When we, when we begin to do that, we just elevate people above Jesus. That should never happen. In our life. We elevate our circumstance above Jesus. But I love what he says here. This Isaac of Stella. He, he, he says this. He says, 
He, he, and I don't know if this is a prayer or just sort of a general statement to the public. Uh, I don't know if this is something that he wrote down for people to read. But here's what he says. He says, may the Son of God, who is already formed in you, grow in you. And I want you to see this part. So that for you, he will become immeasurable. And I want you to hang on to that for just a moment. Because what this man is saying is, his prayer for them or the statement that he is making, whatever it is, he is saying, I hope Jesus becomes everything to you. So much so that you can't even measure the greatness of God in your life. That you can't measure the presence of Jesus in your life. That Jesus is so much to you, that Jesus is everything to you, that as you look into the life of Jesus... You, you can't even begin to fathom how great he is. And I believe that's what Paul's doing here. He's praying, and he's praying from a prison cell. He says, my life may be over. My life may not have much more, uh, you know, I, I may not have much more to offer, but I am praying that you would know more of Jesus and that as you come to know more of Jesus, that he would just fill you with his grace, that you would be moved by his power and you would have the courage that comes only from a Savior who rescued you from your sin. That's what I, I believe Paul is saying here. And he says it in the simplest of ways. I'm praying these things for you. What things? What things are, pray, are Paul praying? What things can we look at and begin to realize these would be really good things for us to pray for each other? Well, first of all, we see a prayer. We see a prayer to love more. A prayer to love more. Now, I want us to, I want us to dig into this one a little bit because I think this is hugely important. Paul had a great affection for the Philippians. We know that, but we also know that the Philippians had a great affection for him. As we read through the different stories that are told, the different verses that we are given in God's word, we begin to realize that there was this affection that went both ways. There was a, a great love and admiration for each other, and they loved him well, and he loved them well. If there was ever a church knew how to love one another, it was probably the church at Philippi. And so as we look at this, we have to wonder, well, why is it that that would be the top of his list in praying for them? I, I would almost guess, and this is sort of where my mind went as I was thinking through this, as I was like, why was that so important to the Apostle Paul when he had such a great relationship? I could understand it if he was writing to the Corinthians or somebody else and, and he felt like there was sort of this broken relationship or something and, and, and you know, they, they were wrestling with different things and he didn't feel like they loved him and he didn't really have a strong love for them. He, I could see where he might say to some of the other churches, well, I'm praying that you would love better, that you would love others better. But why the Philippians? Why is it that the Apostle Paul would write to the Philippians and say, my prayer, and this was his first prayer, that my prayer is that your love may abound more and more. And I believe it's because of this. Because the Apostle Paul understood that love is the very foundation of biblical Christianity. It is the bedrock. It is the foundation. It is the starting place. It is the beginning. You see, the scriptures tell us that God is love. Now you got to hang on to that one. That's straight out of God's word. That's straight out of the Bible. That God is love. The Bible also teaches us that God is love, and the only way that we are able to love him is because he first loved us. Okay? So, so we begin to see this pattern of love forming. God is love. God is, God is love. Everything about God is love. And so God is love, and we can only love him because he first loved us us. And so we, we read the scriptures and we begin to realize that there's something really powerful about what the Bible has to tell us about love. But we begin to realize that it is the very foundation of biblical Christianity. Scripture tells us this in, in 1 John 4 verses 7 through 9. It says, dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. You see that? Love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. Anyone who does not know, love does not know God because God is what? 
love. God is love. Those aren't my words. That's words straight from the Bible, straight from God's words, straight from Scripture. God is love. And so we see this. And then in verse 9, we see something really incredible. It says, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. So he says this, it says in verse nine, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us. What was made manifest among us? We just went through this in December. Jesus was made manifest in front of us. God, Emmanuel, Jesus coming to this earth, made, uh, sent to this earth on our behalf stemming from this deep love that God has for us. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Amen? God is love. We can only love because God is love. God loved us so much that he sent his son. Well, I'm sure the Philippians, and I'm sure Paul understood those truths. So there's gotta be more to it, right? You know, as I was thinking about why it is that Paul felt it so necessary to write to them and say, man, I'm praying that your love would abound, that it would be even greater. I, I, I remembered what Jesus said in John chapter 13. And he says this. He says, a new commandment I give to you. So, okay, uh, this is a commandment. We need to understand this. This is something that that Jesus is instructing his disciples to do. There's no wiggle room when there's a commandment, by the way. There's no wiggle room. You don't get to pick and choose anymore, right? This is a commandment from God. Anything other than loving one another is sin. Let's call it what it is. And so he says here, this is Jesus' words. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And then look at verse 35. He says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Here's what verse 35 is revealing to us. Did you see, when, when we display, no, not when we display, when we genuinely and sincerely love one another and put on display, when we choose to follow Christ in obedience and love one another, the church becomes more visible, not for ourselves, but for the glory of God. In other words, when the church, when people on the outside of this faith family, when they look into Cross Point's inner being and they begin to evaluate who we are as a local congregation, as a local body, of believers as a faith family, when they look into our lives and they see us loving one another, when they see us loving one another, then what we have in essence done is we have put on, on display the glory of Christ and what Christ has done in us. It's not that they would like us better or that we would be more attractional so that other people would come, it's to bring glory to God. And we do this because he's commanded us to do it. And we are obedient to the commandments of God because we love him back after he first loved us. And so we see something really powerful here as we start thinking about what Jesus is saying here because we begin to realize that, that what becomes hugely important is that not just that we love each other, but that the world would see that we love each other. And again, all for the glory of God. The second thing that we see Paul praying for is a, pr a prayer to pursue excellence. A prayer to pursue excellence. We read in verse nine, he says, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. And then he says in verse 10, so that you may approve what is excellent. Now, it's really important that you understand the context of this word that we see here, this word excellence. What Paul is not talking about are just good things and bad things. He's not talking about good times and bad times. He's not talking about like when we go to a concert and we come out and we go, boy, that was excellent. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about things. He's talking about those elements in our life that lead to a sanctified and holy life. He's talking about for the believer to be aware of those things in which 
would bring about change in his life that he may become or she may become more holy. He's talking about spiritual sanctification that is happening. And you see, there's a lot of things that impact our life. There's a lot of things in this world that aren't good for us, amen? There's a lot of things in this world that just simply we need to walk away from. They don't need to be a part of our life. But there are other things in our life that we say, there's nothing wrong with that. There's, this is good. This is fun. This is, you know, and, and that's all good and well. But the reality of what Paul is talking about are not even those things. He's talking about those spiritual elements like the, the truth of God's word. He says that you may approve what is excellent. What is excellent? Well, the truth of God's word, that you would value God's word, that you would understand that God's word is transformative and God wants to transform your life. He would, he would say that you honor and value those things like prayer, journaling, things that are bringing about spiritual change in your life. So he's not just saying those things that entertain us. He's not just saying those things that give us warm fuzzies. He's talking about the things that bring us to a place where Christ's likeness becomes a reality in our world. And so he says, I, I'm praying that you would recognize these things. I'm praying that you would see these things, things like obedience and even serving others. You know, I pray that you would recognize that these things are excellent and these are the things that you need to embrace in your life. J.C. Ryle, he, he writes this, and I think this is very interesting, although it's a sad reality in our world today. He says, there is a common worldly kind of Christianity in this day, which many have. A cheap Christianity, which offends nobody and requires no sacrifice, which costs nothing and is worth nothing. I'm not saying that's you or me. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's anybody in this church, but I, I am saying this, that that this is a reality in our world. There are many people in this world that might hold the banner of Christianity high and declare for themselves the title Christian and look nothing like Jesus. That exists in our world today. And so what Paul says is he says, I pray that you wouldn't be like the hypocrite. I pray that you wouldn't be like the one who who doesn't know Jesus, that, that grabs on more to the world than anything else in their life. He says, I pray that you would be able to approve those excellent things, those things that are gonna bring about spiritual growth in your life, that you would mature and that you would flourish in your faith. That's what he's praying for. The final thing that I wanna point out here that Paul is praying for is he's also and what we see here is a prayer to live blamelessly. A prayer to live blamelessly. Let, let me just say this because it's very important. Blamelessness is not perfection. Okay, and we need to understand that. Blamelessness is not perfection. Uh, we, we know this because of really two verses that exist in Scripture. We know that blamelessness is not perfection. Because of two verses. The first verse is Job 1.1, which says that Job was a blameless and upright man. That's a, pretty good, that's a pretty good title to give someone, isn't it? He was a man who was blameless and upright. He was a man who pursued the righteous things of God. He was a man who was faithful with his life. He was blameless. But we also have Romans 3.23 that says what? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so when you bring those two together, we can only recognize, I, I think Job is one of those that, that as we examine his life and the sort of the titles that he's given, blamelessness and uprightness, we, we, we might be tempted to say, man, he was living the perfect life, but we read Romans 3.23 and we begin to realize that all has sinned and falls short of the glory of God. And so therefore, that can't be true that blamelessness is perfection. And so now that we've sort of cleared that up, let us understand here that what Paul is praying for, he says, I pray that you would live blamelessly, that you would live a life that is blameless. What does it mean then? If it's not perfection, what does it mean? What does it mean that, that we are to live 
blamelessly. Well, there's a passage in Scripture that I believe sort of clears this question up for us, and it reveals two things. Let me give you the thing, then we'll look at the passage here. The first thing that blamelessness is, is is having a desire for spiritual integrity. In other words, it's taking a stand against sin in your life. It's fighting off uh, those sins in your life, even those hidden things in your life, those things that nobody else sees. It's, it's you taking a stand uh, uh, toward uh, spiritual integrity, being a person of moral character because you do everything in your power to follow Jesus and to be obedient to his commands, to live that life without sin. And so it, it, it's something within us that, where we are desiring always to live for the spiritual integrity. But it also is living in such a way as we don't cause others to stumble. And this is important to understand. You see, your life is not just about you. Your life is not just about you and Jesus sort of frolicking in a meadow and and just having this glorious life. Your life is about bringing glory to God and making much of him with your life that others may know him as well but when we refuse to live a life that is blameless even though our life may be somewhat good but we when we find ourselves around others and we don't live that life that causes those individuals to stumble then we're not living blameless lives i love what we read in second corinthians chapter 1 verse 12 And it says this, it says, Paul's writing to the Corinthian church this time, and he says this, he says, we can say with confidence, now remember, blamelessness is not perfection, right? So Paul, and what he is saying here, he's not claiming to be perfect, he's not claiming to be perfect, but he is saying that he is living the life where he is in pursuit of God's holiness and with all sincerity. He says here, we can say with confidence and with a clear conscience that we have lived with a God-given holiness and sincerity in all of our dealings. We have depended on God's grace, not on our own human wisdom. Now look at this. Here's where it comes into play. That is how we have conducted ourselves. Now here's the thing. That is how we have conducted ourselves. Paul says, I have lived in pursuit of the holiness of God, and I've tried with everything within me to shun sin in my life. But look at what he says. He doesn't finish there, does he? He says, and we have, this is how we have conducted ourselves. What does he add to that? Before the world, and especially toward you. So Paul says this. He says, I've lived my life in such a way that I do everything I can to live a life of holiness and righteousness that Jesus himself has imparted on my life. He doesn't claim perfection. He just says, this is my pursuit. But he also says, I've lived this way in front of my friends. I've lived this way in front of the world. I've lived the way I have lived. I have conducted myself in a manner that everybody around me, when they look into my life, they see Jesus and not anything else. This is important. I believe we live in a world today where so many people embrace Jesus on Sunday morning, 11 o'clock. And you don't see much of him again until next week. That's the sad reality, isn't it? So who are we going to be? Who are we going to be? Are we going to be like them? Or are we going to listen to what the Apostle Paul is saying to a church whom he loves, whom he cares about, who he has great affection for and only wants the best for? Are we going to look at the things that he's praying for, for their life? And are we going to commit to praying for each other in the same way? Is that who we're going to be? Are we going to be like the hypocrites of the world? I can tell you this. Your staff and your leadership are praying for you. 
the way Paul prayed for the Philippian church. You know why? Because we care about you. We have a great affection for you. We love you. And we know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that he came that we may have life and have it abundantly. And we know that Jesus is just a better way seven days a week for your life. And so in the same way that Paul prayed for the Philippian church, know this, your pastor is praying that for you. I don't stand up here and say what I say to bring about condemnation in your life. I stand up here and say what I say because I care about you, because I love you. And I know that pursuing Jesus is a lot better for you. I believe that with all of my heart. There is nothing that can replace him. There is nothing that is greater. I believe that with all of my heart that Jesus is better for you than anything else that this world might prescribe to you. The world might promise you temporary happiness, but they can't give you joy. They can't, get, they can't give you joy. They can't. Only Jesus. And I don't know where you're at this morning. I only know where I'm at. I know where some of you are at because you've talked with me. But I mean, on a spiritual level, I, I don't know where you stand. I don't know what's next for you. I, I just know that if we're not careful, there'll be things in our life that keep us from making that next step. Paul says, I'm praying for you because I love you. And I'm praying that love would abound in you. That love would abound more and more. That you would approve of those things that are excellent, those things that are good, those things that will change your life. Not only approve of them, but recognize them, embrace them, apply them to your life. More than that, I'm praying that you would learn how to live a life in pursuit of Jesus and one that everyone around you recognizes that blameless life. As Jordan said earlier, we've been talking a lot, and I have great expectations for 2020. And it has nothing to do with what you might expect. It has everything to do with you knowing Jesus more. Knowing him more. I leave you with this. Jesus says, love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. This is the first and great command. This morning as we wrap up, if you'd like to come to this altar and pray, if you'd like to come and meet me on the front or maybe Ross over here on this side and Pat, Pat will be over here as well. Some of our other pastors are scattered around in different places. If you'd like to come and pray with us, we're here to pray with you. But could we this morning pray for each other? Could your prayer as we close out this morning not be about anything other than the person sitting to your left or your right? 